they may change in your lifetime. They haven't changed in mine or in the lifetime before, but you never know. Um, then, most importantly, we're going to talk about how water is bound to protein. And that's a very important concept because you'll use that in the rest of the semester. And then we're going to talk about factors that contribute to poor quality. So, uh, one thing I want to talk about first is what are the poor quality issues? I think you talked about this in lab. There's a reason that we do exercises in lab and try to tie those into to, uh, what's really going on. But intramuscular fat, marbling. Things we talked about with marbling in the last lecture, they're important to pork as well. Color is a huge issue with pork because there's variation in color. We talk about color in pork uh, more than we talk about color in beef and in lamb. In beef we talk about it, but it's dark color versus normal instead of uh, variation in color. But pork varies in color. We actually have measurements of that, and we know that it's still today varies in color as a retail meat case. And also, pork has a bigger issue with pH and drip loss because uh, hogs go through metabolism a little bit differently than ruminants, and they are more susceptible to pre-slaughter stress, and they're, they go through rigor much faster inherently. So we're cattle without ES or anything, it would take about 12 to 24 hours to get through rigor, Hogs get through rigor in three to six hours, okay? So they go through rigor much faster. We have more issues with uh, final pH, which affects drip loss. And then palatability is also important. You ate, uh, was it two and four taste that you ate? Two and four? Color score? No, one, three. Oh, a one, three to six, whoa. So, uh, and you evaluated juiciness, tenderness, and flavor. And they differed, didn't they? <coughs> yeah. So that's important. And when we go to consumers, I'm going to show you a little bit of data. Consumers say, yeah, it's important. They tell differences, too, just like you did. They tell differences. And then those factors that affect pork quality, the biggest one is pre-harvest stress, long-term and short-term, uh, genetics. And then we'll talk briefly about breed effects, but we won't spend much time because we only have one lecture. Right, and uh, but there are breed effects. So let's talk first about uh, intramuscular fat. And we've just talked about marbling. We just talked about marbling's impact on on um, on flavor, and it's the same for pork. And I don't want you to know all this stuff. What I want you to know is that yeah, a lot of people looked at it, and guess what? It's the same problem we have in pork is that our average fat content in pork is less than 2%. And remember when I talked about beef, you know, I said traces are practically devoid are 1 and 2%. And remember the box, the standard box? So is it any wonder that we have some variability? Because we're basically comparable to standard. Uh, the pork industry uh, in the 90s, 1990s, uh, did develop marbling cards. Uh, we know that the Japanese market wants uh, higher amounts of marbling. And the sad part is this is where we are in our industry. There are some specialty programs to get up to here. Sometimes you can find a tin. Usually it's Berkshire meat. Uh, very special uh, product. Costs a lot more because it costs a lot to produce them. But intramuscular fat, all those things we talked about, does affect juiciness, tenderness, and flavor. And when we go to consumers, uh, and again, I, there's not really a lot of new information here. It's just to say, everything we've learned, it's there. And this is a large consumer study. Uh, we, uh, the pork quality um, consumer study where we took enhanced and non-enhanced pork, and I spent a lot of my life on this study. We went to four different cities, two weeks in each city. We ran um, 300 consumers in each city, and we had consumers, they ate lots of different things, but we, they were randomized by percent chemical lipid, 
So this is intermuscular fat. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Relates to those carbs, right? And these are predicted mean consumer response. So one to eight. Uh, this is dislike extremely, eights like extremely. Done some consumer things in lab too. We had, have we had the lab at this the, uh, page where they're doing consumer ratings? Yeah, so you've done consumer ratings, you know what those are. And these are the mean values, the, the non-enhanced right here, uh, 1%. Almost five, five, five point eight, five point one four. So the, there is a linear trend. It was significant. There's a lot of observations in each one of those bars, and you say, oh, I don't know if that's really a lot. From a consumer standpoint, we changed it point two five. That's huge on eight point scale. That mean, and they could tell it, and they were consistent, and they didn't know what they were eating. They had no idea, and so. Uh, consumers can tell a difference. If you enhance it, does, mar does marbling account for it? Oh, yeah, it's just a little bit higher on the scale, but we still have about a two point, a point two five difference. It's just that overall they like it a little bit better to begin with, but marbling does even help enhance pork. So marbling is important in pork. Uh, the pork industry does not have a grading system that incorporates uh, marbling, but we know for some of our export markets, they do some selection. Color, color's the, the biggest thing that varies. Through genetic selection, we've basically selected uh, the marbling out of pork. Okay. Uh, but we still have a lot of variation in color. And in lab, you use the color cards and you also measured with a Minolta. And with a Minolta, you got L star, A star, and B star values. And those color cards relate to L star values. Uh, if our color cards are in good shape, you can use a Minolta and you get those kind of L star values, close. Uh, and what you see is that as pork gets lighter, L star values go up, right, higher values because that means there's more light reflection. And we know that consumers like a three to four, maybe a four and a half, okay? But we have a lot of variation in the product. And we know that color is somewhat related to pH, not perfectly, not one, not a perfect match, but about 0.75 to 0.8. So we know that um, that post-mortem or pre-post-mortem pH decline is very highly related to color. And the reason it is is that if we have a lower pH on the top, we have more free water. And if we have more free water, when light reflects down, it reflects back up. So um, I was flying into Des Moines, I served on a number of pork board committees, and so I used to go to Des Moines about once every two months. And uh, it was about five o'clock in the afternoon and the sun was going down and I looked out the window and I didn't realize there were so many ponds around water features of some type around Des Moines. My husband's from Iowa, you know, I know a little bit about Iowa, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Why have I not noticed this before? Because I go to Des Moines a lot. Light reflection. It's like PSE pork. It's like light colored pork. The light is reflecting off the water. Oh, yeah, look at it. Kind of ironic because I was going to a pork board meeting. But anyway, that was uh, one of those aha <coughs> moments. Where I'm like, yeah, it really does work. Right? When you're flying down and the lights come down and it reflects off that. Okay, works, right? So we know that we measure color instrumentally, either using a Minolta or a Hunter. And then for our humans, we use the color card. So when pork nerds sit around and talk about pork quality, we talk about fours and fives and twos and threes, okay? So we just finished this week the big pork project that Hannah's been doing. And uh, so 
Toby talked to Smithfield about going and collecting pork. And so when I, when I got a hold of, found out that Dustin uh, Morehouse was our contact, Dustin and I talked, I said, well, we want juice and pork. He knew exactly what I was talking about. Oh yeah, sure, we'll have some of those. We'll have, well, let's go to the, um, to the old Hormel plant. Uh, that's what we all call it. Uh, it's Smithfield plant now, because that's where we have the most variability because we bring in a lot of smaller lots of, of hogs across that for smaller producers instead of producing most of our own animals from the Smithfield production. Okay, so see how that works? Oh, Juice and pork, do exactly, do exactly. So we know it's very highly related to pH decline. And we're gonna talk about that in just a minute, but in that same study, uh, what we did is um, we measured Minolta L-star value. And what was interesting here, this is, these values, these are p-values. They're only significant if they're less than 0.05. Are those significant? No. I just told you color was important, didn't I? For our consumer responses, look at that. Overall live juice values. Look at these p-values. The thing is, these are interrelated statistically, and pH is, this just tells us, yeah, this is important because if we look at the interrelationship, remember it's 0.8. They're not independent. They're supposed to be independent to do what I, what we just looked at, right? But they're not. They're inter, they're very much interrelated. So pH was very, very important, and it is highly related to color. So color is important, but there's more going on there. And look, here was, it, was significant, wasn't it? And for, for everything, pH and more vascular care force were really significant, and marbling was really significant too, wasn't it? And um, we took the different internal temperatures. We'll talk about that later. So consumers could tell a difference. And when we ran um, pH, so 5.4 pH, you know what that means, right? Up to 6.4. I don't know what, uh, what were your pH values in lab? Oh, were they? They were pretty high. Were they? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, really high. How were Mundy? Um, about, they were probably a little high. You had a six? Three. 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 But anyway, because that might be an instrumental issue, right? You always think about that, right? That always gets, take the value and write it down. So in this study, uh, when we increase pH by 0.2 units, 0.2, so 5.6 to 5.8, 5.8 to 6.0, think about that, 0.2 pH units, we improve juiciness by 0.2 units. Remember I told you that 0.25 in the previous slide was pretty big? And this linearly is even a stronger relationship than marbling, isn't it? Look at what happens. So we go from 4.7 basically to 4.8, 4.9, 5.1, 5 5.2, 5 5.3. I mean, those are, that's a really a much a little bit steeper slope, isn't it? Meaning that pH is a little bit bigger driver than intramuscular fat, okay? So when we write up here, so we talk about marbling, right? Talk about color, talk about pH. We know these are really highly related, right? But not perfect, but highly. 
and that when we change pH, we have a bigger effect on consumer liking than marbling, but both of them have an effect, right? And the color, I just showed you the slide where the color didn't, because all of it was explained here. And I had some multivariate analysis to show you that, that uh, you know, once you pull the interdependency out, that they're both important. But I don't, it's Friday morning, before the Kentucky game, right? Yeah, you're like, oh, please don't do that. Something that has the word statistics in it, oh, yeah. So, this is the big one, right? I'm gonna put two stars there and one star there. And this is enhanced uh, overall life and then juiciness life is in the, the green. And uh, I put that up there because Juiciness was a big driver of overall life in pork, much more than in beef. Juiciness and tenderness in beef are really, really connected. And pork, because it is so susceptible to water loss, juiciness is a little bit more important. So, one, two, oh, wow. Kind of neat stuff, isn't it? And you measure pH. This is enhanced and non-enhanced with ultimate pH. Uh, and there was a, what this box shows is that, that the slope of the line, if we connected the dots, once we get above 6.0 for, uh, for enhanced and non-enhanced, this is overall like, notice that we didn't have much of a change in this way we looked at this data. So pH is really important below 6.0. So let's put that up here. That's the important point of this slide. Other than you measure pH and, sorry it didn't work as well, but at least you measure pH and you know what a pH probe is and you know what a, uh, sir, what a what kind of probes we use in the industry and stuff and that's gonna be important in case you work with, with me, right? But with pH, what that relationship said is that um, above 6.0, very little improvement in eating quality. And that's consumer eating quality. I also have all kinds of descriptive attributes sensory on this stuff too. So we were doing both. And then, but from 5.4, yeah, 5.4 to 5.9, increase pH, increase eating quality, all right? So that, this range in here is really important to our industry. And you know what? That's where the most variation is. And you've been pH folks. So uh, that's one nice thing is that I uh, like to do the lab before I give the lectures. Partly is timing, but then you've experienced it. And then, and I'm hoping you take the lab and kind of think about what you experienced in the lab as an individual and tie it to this, okay? So why does all this happen? This is one of the most important slides of the semester, all right? This is the slide when I told one of my previous classes. That this will be on the test. It happens on this door. And when I asked them why, they said, well, if you tell us it's gonna be on the test, we didn't really think you'd put it on. No, I will put this on the test. In 30 years, I have never not put this on the test, okay? So just believe me, because as a meat scientist, this is just so important. So we know that inside that muscle fiber, right? About 17% protein, 75% water. And the proteins interact with the water and hold the water in, which is pretty amazing, right? Go to the retail store, look at the pork that's sitting there and go, ooh, Think of all the water that's really there. I mean, it's a lot of water. But you 
but it's tall. It seems somewhat solid, right? Semi-solid, I guess. Mm -hmm. Not as solid as a brick or stone or this table, but it's pretty solid, isn't it? So what happens? There are three layers of water bound in heat, and the proteins, and especially those acidic basic proteins like myosin. Oh, 50 percent of the proteins, myosin, and they're long chain, and they have a bunch of charges. So let me just draw this up here. Okay, here's a protein, and we know that when they have acidic and basic amino acids, they have side chains. So if I'm a protein, I'm acidic, basic, and, um, amino acids, I have side chains here. And those side chains, which are basically CO, uh, I'll just, I get, I'll draw it like there because um, COO, okay, there's a negative charge. That negative charge is kind of like a force field, right? It's an ionic charge. <coughs> and so close to it, it's really strong. And as you get further away, the strength of that charge is less. So I used to use the example of uh, Lost in Space. Now you've probably ever heard of this show. It's a really cheesy show from the 1960s. And it was one of, it was the precursor to Star Trek, but I would consider it yeah, probably low, low budget. You know, I mean, nothing's really believable. It's really cheesy. But they would always have a force field to protect them from the aliens when they landed on a new planet. Okay. And, the, and then there were always the drama associated with the aliens trying to get through the force field. All right. So when I learned about ionic uh, bonding, that's what I thought about. Right. So this negative charge, we know this is 17%, but we have a bunch of water, which is a polar compound. Right? So water has a positive pole and a negative pole. Right? What do you think that positive pole is going to do right here? Yeah, it's going to attach. It's going to go. Right? So here's going to be water. And when water attaches here, but it's not, it's only ionic bonding, right? It's not covalent. Remember, covalent is, <coughs> takes a lot of energy to pull that apart. Ionic bonding is, I'm attracted to you, okay? It's attraction. So this is an attraction. So this force field, this is after water is bound to it. The force field is, See if I can draw this, okay? So it still has a force field, but it's diminished, isn't it? But boy, this is it. it this water really likes that oxygen. All okay? right, it's very organized, and this is called bound. So for water holding capacity, which is what this is, the first layer of water is bound water. And it's held by ionic forces. And I used to teach food chemistry, and we talked about different kinds of bonding, right? And in measure kilojoules, that's just how much force it requires to pull something apart. And carbon-carbon bondings are really take a lot of force, right? So this is me pulling a puppy off of there's an attraction, and there's a, oh, I want to be here, but I can pull it off eventually, right? So it's it's pretty, it's strong, but not that strong, all right? Ionic forces. Well, but there's still some force left, isn't there? There's still, yes? Um, is the carbon part of the chain, or is it coming off of the chain? The carbon is part of the chain. Okay. That's part of the amino acid, okay. yeah. Yeah, so that'd be kind of like my arm sausage. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is part of the chain. It's, yeah, good, good question. Okay. So, 
Well, so with this is bound, but we still have this force here. So we have weaker ionic force. Let's just call that weaker. This now, once we have bound, so we're gonna call this bound, but now we still have weaker because kind of interrupted it, hasn't it? But we still have weaker ionic forces. So the other water, I mean, not all the water can get here, can it? Because there's only so many little side chains. So water still organizes, and notice how it organizes. Because there's a couple, th that not only do we have the weaker ionic force, but we also have this negative pole. Remember, it's not negatively charged, it's just a detraction, right? So this water still organizes, and it's attracted here, but it's called immobilized. It's not as strongly bound, okay? So the weaker ionic forces, this is going to be the immobilized water. So we have immobilized data here, right? And this is bound by weaker ionic forces. Well, so let me draw in here some water, right? And then here's another H. Oh, right here, right? So it because it's still organized and it's still being held a little bit. I know that's kind of confusing right now if you just looked at it, but hopefully as I built that drawing, it made, it made sense. So there's still some force there. Well, there's still some more water. And this water isn't, we've ran out of forces. Right? Because the forces don't go as far. But we still have, so let me just kind of, so this is bound, this is immobilized. So we still have some water, and this is called free water. I'm running out of room here. Free. And it's held by capillary forces. And capillary forces are like when we, when you go to read in a graduated cylinder, and you have a meniscus, Right, where uh, you have, uh, and you have water and it's like this. This, holding, bringing it up the sides are capillary forces. And those are pretty weak. So when we look at bound, immobilized, and free up here, and notice this water, uh, there's some polarity, you know, these are polar, so they're, they're kind of organized a little bit. But this is held by capillary forces. And if we're going to rank these three by strength of binding, toughest, medium, least. So when you see purge, free water. Right? That's free water. When you cook meat and you lose moisture, it's free and a little bit immobilized. Right? When you measure drip loss, you're measuring free water. What easily comes loose, what drips out. Purge. So free water right here. Free is going to be purge, drip loss. Can you measure drip loss in the lab? Did that work with the one, three, and Oh, okay. Because drip loss is going to come out really fast in the package. So usually, I can tell you, industry measures drip loss by purge. When you have a pork loin that's swimming in the bag, and we've had pork loins swimming in the bag, yeah, they're usually low pH. Pardon? Our one loin. Your one was, oh, good, good, yay. <laughs> so, and you measure drip loss. Uh, so that's, that's what that's an indication.
combination of. And what we know is that the next slide is also important. Because, how do we affect this force field? Affect it by pH. So in lost in space, going back to lost in space, to bring a clip of it, it's always so cheap. I thought it was so, such a good show, you know, when you're growing up, you hit one channel and then you have black light. But um, the aliens would have technology that would affect their force field. So, the, so when they landed on some alien planet and they got out, they would try to use their force field to protect them and they would interfere in it. So that's low pH, okay? And versus their normal, because what happens with pH? Okay, so I'm, you got that, right? I, so what happens here is that if we change pH, so I'm gonna put low pH, and this over here is normal pH. So I need to draw some more things, I'm using pink, okay. C, zero, zero. Another C. All right. So now let me draw it over here. Let's see if I have the same number. here comes a hydrogen. But there aren't that many hydrogens, remember, because there's a lot of protein in there. Over here, we not only get it there, we get it there, and let's put one here, all right? That's pretty extreme. Which is gonna have higher water holding capacity, the normal or the low? normal, right? And if we go to high pH, oh, we even have lower hydrogens, right? So we get, we get fewer of those. So what pH does is the hydrogen ion interferes in that force field. Well, if they're going to interfere in that force field, we're going to have less, less water inbound and immobilized and actually three just kind of like actually increases because what happens, let me go back. And what happens here is that we move the dashed lines over because, and that puts more water over here in free. Ah, what does that mean? More drip loss, it's more free water. We call this the ionic effect or the pH effect. And so what's key here is knowing that pH, the isoelectric, well, we're gonna talk about isoelectric points. 
but the pH of the environment, because it affects how much hydrogen, affects the side chain. So you can think about if I'm a protein and this is my side chain, you know, a normal pH, I'm like grabbing water, right? And then here comes a bunch of hydrogens, low pH. Oh, I'm happy I have something. Oh, I'm still grabbing. So then more free water, less water holding capacity, lower pH, lower water, or water holding capacity because of these little guys. Very important. Okay, so every protein, you probably don't remember this, as the second and third day of class, as we talked about uh, some of the proteins, I talked about isoelectric point. So we need to know what isoelectric point is. Very important is the pH. See, notice the word, first word pH. Where there's a balance of positive and negative charges on the protein side chain. Okay, so this is isoelectric point. And please look at your textbook uh, on page. 135 and look at their description of this because you do need to know what isoelectric point is so every single protein and we can take titan we can take nebula we can take desmond we can take myosin we can take actin they all have an isoelectric point if we take meat and we just grind all the proteins up and we measure isoelectric point that isoelectric point in meat is about 5.2 5.3, depending on the meat. Okay, so in meat, on average, pH equals 5.2 to, sorry, 2 to 5.3, in that range, lower fives. So what happens is, that's where, if we measure, if we use drip loss as our measurement of water holding capacity, there are other measurements of water holding capacity. The drip loss is really the best one. We find that we have the lowest water holding capacity. If we take pH and take it higher, water holding capacity on average goes up. Now I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you remember this, but isoelectric point of actin is 4.8. Of myosin is 5.4. Well, myosin is 50% of the protein, right? And it's all the any long protein has a bunch of side chains, and it's really responsible for holding most of the thing. And Titan, you know, as long as it's still intact, and anything that's a nebula and all those, have some water holding capacity. But myosin is the big driver of this. So what you're gonna do in the rest of the class after, after me, at least for today, um, you're gonna be playing with water holding capacity and pH. You're gonna play with it. Then you're gonna eat it, right? And that's a lot of what you're doing when you're developing new products and working with product you. And what you know, I got my first raise at Bonker because they thought I was just so smart because I uh, increased the pH using sodium phosphate of our pre-cooked uh, top round and increased our cooked meals and we made more money. I didn't laugh. Oh, don't tell them I learned that that's That's okay, right? You know, yeah, pay me more money, I'm so smart. Yeah, I just, Lynn Schmidt was like, yeah, Miller, I told you that. Yeah, I know, it works. It really works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, it works. And what we're doing is, when we, uh, as we move towards isoelectric point, we're increasing hydrogens and we're, changing water holding capacity. Does that make sense? 
So isoelectric point is the pH where there is a balance of positive and negative charges on the protein. And every protein is slightly different, but on average meets about 5.2, 5.3. Now we don't deal with this range. We can increase water holding capacity by getting the pH really, really low. <coughs> Looks really bad. Because pH also affects other proteins, right? And in meat, our protein's the nature. And myoglobin the nature, so that's not really good. Looks bad, but yeah, it would have good water holding capacity. It's easier to increase pH and get it closer to normal. And Dr. Kurth will talk about how when we add uh, salt, we actually change isoelectric point of protein. Pretty neat stuff. You need to know this concept first. So what happens in pork? Well, we, we know that we can have a normal pH decline and meat's gonna look normal. That was your three that you had in lab. But we can have, and pork is so much more susceptible to, uh, to, to fight or flight stress mechanism. And so part of what happens in pork is that if the animals are excited, and we're gonna talk about that, I don't know if we're gonna have time to talk about it. <laughs> if, if they're excited, then they're gonna have a very rapid pH decline because they're in fight or flight mode. All metabolism's like, ah, let me go, I need to go, right? And that their metabolism increases, so their change from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism is much faster. That means they build up more lactic acid. And if you rev up the engine, we see these very rapid pH declines where the final pH is lower. We're gonna talk about that in a second. If we have time, if not, we'll talk about it on Monday. So, drip loss, you measured drip loss in lab. You had a, a one, a three, and a six. Uh, for color, and that's kind of what you have up here. There's some method to our madness. And uh, this is the amount of drip they got out of the package in each of those colors. So you, the reason that the color is lighter and there's more drip loss is there's probably some protein denaturation of the, of the myoglobin, but mainly because the light, there's more free water and the light reflects off of it. And that's why the L star values are higher. Think of Des Moines. Oh, look at all the milk. Right? That's PSE. Right? This is the mountains of Colorado. <laughs> okay? No free water, because there's a lot of we've we've just increased this force field to be higher. Because there's no not as much hydrogen. It's all based on how much hydrogen is available in the pH. So color, that's how come there is a relationship. Um, I'm not gonna talk about steric effect. And we just have about three minutes. And I wanna introduce this concept because what I really, I mean, if you know this, yes, right? You will play with this every day in the meat industry, okay? You really will. Whether you're making sausage, or you're working on the slaughter floor, or you're selling meat. Because I have a very good colleague, and every once in a while, I get these, uh, these questions about, all right, we have a bunch of extra purrs. See, people don't wanna buy purrs, because when they open the bag and they pay a lot for meat, the water goes down the, the drain, right? And there's a problem, or I'm just sending the meat back. Yeah. And then you have to figure out how to get it back, and it costs more money, and then we can't sell it to. So, it, yeah, David. What is the difference between parch and drip loss? Pardon? What is the difference between parch and drip loss? Or are they the same? Oh, oh purge. They are, they are interrelated, but purge is the, when you open the package, it's the amount of moisture in the package, okay? And drip loss is what you were measuring, right? And they are interrelated, but they're both, um, if you have a product that purges,
purges a lot, it's not going to have such free water, right? We're measuring purge in the package of the loins you guys are doing, and then we're measuring grip loss. Okay? Because they are somewhat related, but if you have a product that purges a lot, grip loss may also be a little bit higher, but it's probably not as sensible. Right. So, what affects these things? Uh, and I want to talk about them, and I'm going to just talk, this is the biggest one, and I want to introduce this so that on Monday morning, hopefully we're all in a good mood and it would be Kentucky. Um, <clears throat> let's hope that we're not at PSE. Uh, Pre-slaughter stress really affects and short-term pre-slaughter stress and long-term pre-slaughter stress. We have a bigger issue with short-term stress because hogs are smart and they sense things. And if they get excited uh, prior to slaughter, we are going to stimulate the fight or flight system. And that's what this is sometimes. So we're gonna pick up there and we'll talk about uh, fight or flight, and what uh, my plan is is to finish up on this and start on the uh, anti-mortem factor. And I'm going to kind of combine the anti-mortem and post-mortem factors. Um, I'll have some time on Monday, and then I'll finish up on Wednesday. And I'm going to draw a big chart of the board. It's one of my favorite things to do, and um, that should get you ready for the exam on Friday. Okay. So. Puppies are four weeks old, they're five weeks old, that's right. Should I bring China and little China in? Yes. Okay. Well, that may